Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Well, everyone has their own personal list. We could all probably agree on some of the most iconic cars ever made. The VW Beetle, the 1968 Ford Mustang, the 1960 Corvette, the 57 Chevy, the Porsche 911, the 1955 Mercedes Gullwing, the DeLorean, and just for good measure, the 1963 Aston Martin. But equally important is a vehicle that gets little attention. All of its models together only traveled less than 100 miles. When it was built, it was over budget, over schedule, and it was only a two-seater. It was the Lunar Rover vehicle that was part of Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Without it, we'd know a lot less about the moon, about our own planet, and even the solar system. Not bad for a car that was bare bones and electrified long before Elon Musk was even born. That's the story that my guest Earl Swift tells in his new book, Across the Airless Wild. Earl Swift is an author and journalist. His previous books include the New York Times bestseller, Chesapeake Requiem, as well as Autobiography and Big Roads. He's a former reporter for the Virginia Pilot and contributor to Outside Magazine. And it is my pleasure to welcome Earl Swift back to this program to talk about Across the Airless Wilds, the lunar rover, and the triumph of the final moon landings. Earl, thanks so much for joining us once again. Jeff, it's it's great to be back. Well, it's great to have you here. What was it that attracted you to this initially? It's something from quite a while ago, long forgotten in many quarters, and, and, and even when it was contemporary, kind of neglected. Well, it was. And uh, I guess the short answer is that I turned 13 the day that Apollo 15 landed on the moon in July of 1971. And I have very little recollection of the moon missions, that, or, and especially the one moon mission that most people remember, Apollo 11. I was, I was just too young. My, I remember my parents being very excited about it, but I have no clear recollection of it myself. But I do remember 15, 16, and 17 in 1971 and 1972. Um, you know, I was, I was a teenager. I just turned a teenager that day. Uh, but more than, more than age, I think, it's the fact that they carried a new piece of gear with them. And, and um, you know, they were driving on the moon. And um, I didn't have my driver's license yet, but um, it, it made a powerful impression on me. I remember uh, very clearly watching them on live TV. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that it, it took close to 50 years before uh, those recollections turned into uh, – uh, curiosity as to exactly what those those little cars achieved, but when I did start looking into it, I was astounded to find that they were utterly transformative. That you can divide the Apollo moon missions into before the rover and after, and they bear very little resemblance to each other. And yet, one of the things you write about is that the idea of of doing a rover, the idea of incorporating it into into the Apollo program was something that was thought about pretty early on. It took a long time for it to happen, and we'll talk about that. But the notion of it was kicking around for quite a while. Uh, before, Long before uh, NASA, long before Sputnik, uh, a certain uh, German, uh, former Nazi, former SS officer, uh, creator of a weapons of, weapon of mass destruction intended to, uh, to kill allies, i.e. us, um, envisioned using a, uh, a rover on the moon that was more a, a, a hulking caterpillar tractor style tank with a pressurized cabin in, in which astronauts would you know, travel for hundreds of miles in, um, you know, on, on epic odysseys. And that German, of course, was Werner von Braun, who, uh, who went on after that to, uh, to become part of NASA and to uh, lead the effort to to design and build the Saturn V rocket that lifted all this to the moon. And that was in 1952 that he he first publicly um, predicted the need for a rover. And when did the reality of it take hold, the idea that that something could be built that could be incorporated into Apollo? I think think the idea never left once von Braun... um, shared his vision in 1952 all through the, the early 1960s you see uh, nasa's marshall space flight center in huntsville contract with private companies to study uh, concepts for rovers and through the first half of the decade those 
those rovers were just as as von Braun had envisioned them. They were big, hulking, multi-toned, pressurized vehicles that would serve not only as uh, transportation but as shelter. They were they would have supplanted the lunar module as the place the astronauts stayed while they were on the moon. And they'd be, you know, drive around in shirt sleeve comfort. They wouldn't have to wear their spacesuits while they were in this thing because it was pressurized. And that changed when NASA's budget started, uh, started to be cut. And the reason it changed is that these gargantuan rovers would have required their own Saturn V just to get to the lunar surface. And, and once the budget started to, to be pared down, NASA realized, you know, we're not going to be having any two rocket missions here. <laughs> And the idea of this smaller rover, this portable two-seater, talk about the evolution of that. Well, it was a pretty sudden evolution. Uh, it was compressed into a very short span of time because after it became obvious that NASA, NASA was not going to be doing any two, two rocket missions, the, the agency kind of backed away from the idea of a rover. And it's... it's uh, bittersweet to look back on, on the attitude of, of the time, which was that Apollo was going to be the first chapter in a lengthy lunar campaign. And so there was really no panic in NASA uh, with this decision. They figured, you know, they, they weren't turning their back on a rover. They were just postponing it. They were putting it on the back burner for a few years, they figured, and they'd take it up again after Apollo. Well, a bunch of the engineers at private companies who had been working on these NASA studies weren't ready to give the idea up. They'd spent years working on this thing. And in particular, a group of engineers at General Motors' uh, Defense Research Lab in Santa Barbara, California, which handled most of the, the company's space work, decided that they were going to try to, to come up with a solution that would not require a second rocket. And that, that required them to, to come up with a rover much smaller than any NASA had considered an open moon jeep, a go-kart effectively that might somehow be folded so that it could be origamied into a space on the lunar module, the landing craft, which was tiny itself. Uh, and the space was about the size and shape of a pup tent. So we're talking about a really small uh, air you know, volume that this folded rover could occupy. And, uh, a uh, Hungarian-born engineer named Ferenc Pavlik in Santa Barbara, uh, after four months of trial and error, came up with a, a way that it could be folded and that you could get a complete car, minimalist, Spartan, stripped down to its essence, but a vehicle that would work, theoretically at least. Was the original design that he came up with pretty close to what finally evolved? Very close. Shockingly close. Uh, GM uh, paired up with, with uh, Boeing, to, to actually build the rover once they got the contract to do so. But most of the particulars are, you know, were worked out ahead of time by, by Ferenc Pavlik. He, he came up most importantly with, uh, with the way it would fold like a business letter to fit on the, on the lunar module. And he, uh, in previous studies, had come up with the wire mesh wheels, you know, the rover's wheel. You couldn't put a pneumatic tire on the rover. Um, given the extremes of temperature on the moon and the um, constant bombardment of cosmic radiation, uh, rubber tires wouldn't last last the mission. So he had invented a tire made out of um, zinc-coated stainless steel piano wire woven into a really tight weave. And, uh, and this wire mesh tire with the wheel on which it was mounted, a 16-inch aluminum wheel, weighed all of 12 pounds on Earth, which just mind-boggling to the staff. I've held one, and it's incredibly light. And um, so a lot of the pieces for the finished rubber were, were already in the bag. They had already been worked out. You know, the, the transmission that was used to step down the fast-spinning little electric motors in each wheel, that had been done on an earlier version of, of the rover that GM had worked on. And Pavlix incorporated all of these already existing ideas into the finished product. Including the, the very groovy-looking fenders that it had. It did, and those were actually laid add-ons. Well, Pavlik didn't do those. Uh, NASA recognized the need, and wisely, uh, for, for, for fenders. And, and the fenders, of course, became really important because the, the moon is covered with two or three or four inches of, of really fine dust. It's, um, we look at the moon, and it, it looks silvery in the sky, but when you're on the surface, that dust, if you pick it up, is almost black. 
And not only is it so fine that it smears, but it's really gritty. If it gets in any machinery, it'll foul it. So it was important to keep dust off of the rover as much as possible. It would, um, if it landed on the electronics, dark as it was, it would absorb heat and threaten to, to cook the electronics in their boxes. If it landed on the astronauts, it would play, you know, it would, it would play hell with their, their own temperature regulation. You know, they had a cooling system built into their suits. Uh, and, you know, if it, if it got into the rings uh, that connected their helmets to their suits, it could foul those. Uh, you don't want to, you know, be on the moon with your, your suit, either with the helmet stuck on or unable to put it on. Um, that would be a bad situation. So they, they came up with a, a way that these wire mesh wheels, which naturally tilled um, this, this fine dust and kind of tossed it forward as the rover drove in, a, in an arcing rooster tail, they came up with these, these fenders to, to hold that dust in check. And as long as the fenders were on the thing, they worked well. One of the ideas that it was so fascinating that was kicked around to, to get them around on the moon was this idea even of jetpacks. Talk about that. Because on the surface, it seemed to make some sense, but not as practical. Well, yeah. I mean, NASA looked for years, and specifically the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, now the Johnson Space Center, looked for years at the prospect of, of developing a one- or two-person um, little mini rocket to get the, the astronauts around the lunar surface. And of course they did this while the, I mean, the lunar module was already in the bag, pretty much Grumman had been building it for years by the time NASA looked at this seriously, but they, they were uh, absolutely serious in their interest in what amounted to, uh, to my untrained eyes, a death trap. You know, this, these, these proposals and a number of companies made proposals were inherently dangerous. I mean, you're talking about um, multiplying the risks of a lunar adventure by, you know, man manifold. It's, uh, but, uh, but luckily, uh, Cooler has prepa prevailed in just after, right about the time of the, uh, the first moon landing in July of 1969, uh, NASA finally folded its, its hand on the idea. Uh, but they took, they took numerous forms. Some look like uh, the flying kind of stand-up pods that you saw in Dick Tracy comics back in the day. And um, some were rocket belts of the sort that Sean Connery wore in Thunderball. I remember that. <laughs> and, um, you know, you had to wear fireproof pants if you, if you flew that particular model of flying belt. And, um, and some were kind of sit-down, one-man um, flying platforms. But they all suffered from, from the same uh, problem, which was that, an astronaut in his spacesuit was very limited in what he could see and what he could do. And, um, and these things required a lot of attention and dexterity and multitasking, something that, that would have been really tough to pull off without killing yourself. What was the intended range of, of the vehicle? Well, I mean, it, it had enough juice to, um, to go 60 miles or so. Uh, there were limitations on how far the astronauts could take it from base camp. And those limitations were based not on the rover, but on uh, the amount of air and cooling water in the astronauts' backpacks. That was very finite. And the, the thinking was, okay, you know, we, we can't let you go farther in the rover than you could walk back if something happened. So that, was the, that was the decider. Uh, and, and the circle, the practical circle around base camp was about six miles. That was about the max. And that had to be reached very early in a mission. You know, in, in a drive. Each of these missions took three drives. Um, so you had to get the, the farthest flung stop of the day out of the way first because you were depleting air and cooling water in that pack all the time you were outside the lunar module. And um, it was important to you know, establish that farthest point and then work your way back towards base camp with each you know, uh, successive stop so that as you depleted your, your supplies, your your life support, you needed less of it to get, get the safety. And uh, so six miles max, the, the farthest uh, the astronauts ever drove was 4.72 miles. And practically speaking, that was right out at the edge. It had taken them 61 minutes to drive that far over some crazy terrain. And if they had had to walk back from there, uh, it would have been a very long 4.72 miles. 
What did the astronauts themselves think of this vehicle? Were they concerned about it? Did they think that it added danger to the mission? What were their thoughts about it? Oh, I think that they were very excited about it. I mean, once they they started training, of course, uh, you know, a couple of years out. And one of the challenges of the rover is kind of unique among Apollo uh, hardware in this respect is you really could never test the actual device. I mean, there was just no way to test it in a one six gravity uh, hard vacuum environment without taking it into that environment. Um, uh, so they, they trained on one G uh, trainers uh, designed to, to operate on earth. And those, those emulated some of its characteristics though, not the way it would ride once it was actually underway on, on the moon. And I think the more they, they trained, the more excited they got about just how more, much more capable this, uh, this little car made a crew. And, you know, we remember Apollo 11, of course, and, and it, deserves, it deserves our memory and, and every accolade that can be heaped upon it. Those guys were first. They were, you know, they're right up there with Captain Cook in, in the annals of exploration. But the fact is that when they got to the moon, they, you know, they weren't able to do much. They were on foot. They had very little time. Uh, and if you were to, I mean, you can put all of their travels inside a football field and have plenty of room to spare. The farthest they ever wandered from the, the lunar module was about 65 yards. And you contrast that with the, the first use of the rover on Apollo 15. They drove more than 17 miles, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin did. And uh, they were able to go hundreds of feet up the sides of mountains. And uh, they were able to explore the, the rim of a, a gargantuan canyon a, a mile wide and a thousand feet deep. It was just a completely different style of exploration and much deeper science. They were able to, you know, on those early missions, the first three of the six, the astronauts were, were relegated to uh, kind of studying one type of Lorraine, you know, which is what the terrain on the moon is called. And, um, the later missions enabled NASA to put the lunar module down in the center of a variety of different types of terrain and to reach each of them. And, uh, and that was, that was new. And, uh, I think it really, I think it really excited those guys. There was also the sense of just exploration when the module, when, when, when the Rover was further out four or five miles out from, from base camp and it was just the rover and them. Yeah, and, and you don't get out farther out on the edge, of the edge, of the edge, uh, than those guys achieved on their their long sorties in the rover. I mean, they they had flown nearly a quarter million miles to get to the moon. Then they climb out of their spaceship. They're one way home, and they they climb into what is essentially a 1969 General Motors product, and they drive <laughs> off beyond sight of that one-way home. That's a new level of, of daring, of chutzpah, you know, I mean, of, of just uh, unbridled courage and faith in American engineering as well. But they did it, and, and, and eagerly. Uh, that was part of the appeal, I think, was to push the edge as far as they could. And certainly they didn't have traffic to worry about. <laughs> Nothing. We're not if they'd run into traffic, we'd we'd still be talking about it. <laughs> Talk about the the technology of it and the fact that it worked as well as it did. Well, it was simple. It was really simple. I mean, they took what we can you know, think of as a car and they stripped it down to its bare essence, and then they stripped it further. And so this was a a tiny aluminum framed electric car ran on two batteries. They were not rechargeable. Those batteries powered a tiny electric motor in each wheel hub. All together, all four of those little electric motors generated one horsepower. So your weed whacker has as much motive brawn as, as this whole car did. But those motors were married to a, a strange and really elegant little transmission called a harmonic drive, which only has three parts, only two of them move, and yet it achieves an 80 to 1 reduction in that engine speed. So if, uh, as in the case with the, with the rover's motors, it's that little electric rotor is spinning at 10,000 revolutions per minute. 
the harmonic drives stepped it down to 125 turns of the rover's wheels. And those turns had power behind them. There was torque there. And it enabled this anemic dribble of power to, to push and pull the astronauts up the sides of mountains. Um, it, was, it was remarkable. It had seats that looked like beach chairs. They were uh, aluminum framed with, with nylon webbing straps. Straps were a little bit more substantial than we're used to seeing on beach chairs, but they were very similar. And it had a trunk out back. So it was, it, you know, General Motors' fingerprints were on it in the sense that it looked like a car. Uh, the other companies that bid on the job, uh, that wasn't that wasn't so much the case. Their their vehicles were clearly not intended for this earth. Uh, you can't really say that about the rover. You can recognize every piece of it. What did the other ones look like? What were the other ideas in terms of how to do this? Well, Grumman uh, had what I think is the the most interesting uh, of the the four proposals that wound up. Uh, you know, before NASA in, in the summer and fall of 1969, it had a, a rover in which the astronauts sat way up front. In fact, you got into it by walking to the front and kind of turning around and sitting down. And uh, it was split in two with a, it had a flexible waist between the front and the back halves of it. And it, and the wheels didn't turn. When you turned the joystick on this thing, it bent in the middle. And that's, that's how it turned. And the, the wheels on it looked like uh, flower pots turned on their sides with the open side facing out, uh, and they were made of, of uh, reinforced fiberglass. It was an amazingly agile and capable machine, but perhaps just a little too far out there for NASA. It was just a little too, uh, it, a little too imaginative uh, in some ways. It, I think it was seen as complicating the simple, but boy, it was, it was interesting. Um, Bendix had a uh, rover proposal that looked like a buckboard out of the old west, down to the wheels. The wheels look retro. Uh, there was, um, uh, Bendix had tried to get around the idea of, of uh, avoiding a, a pneumatic tire, but emulating its ability to absorb impacts by, uh, by building wheels that were, were made of hoops of titanium surrounded by a belt of titanium. And when you hit an object, the belt and the hoop underneath it uh, deformed and then popped back into place afterwards. Um, and it was, you know, the thing about the Bendix machine was it looked, it looked primitive. It really did. I mean, it, it was not a pretty uh, piece of space hardware at all, but it was so simple that there was very little to, to go wrong with it. Um, um, and then Chrysler uh, came up with a, with a rover in which the astronauts sat back to back. It was much smaller. Uh, and there really wasn't a heck of a lot of room for any kind of cargo or tools for that matter. But the uh, the back to back seating doomed it from the start pretty much. To what extent was this rover, this lunar rover, a model for future NASA efforts like the rovers that we've seen on Mars these past several years? That's interesting. I, I don't think, Jeff, that we can uh, establish direct lineage from the Apollo rover to the, the Mars rovers from Sojourner to Perseverance. But what you can do is go back in time to much earlier in GM's rover studies uh, when Pavlix and his, his colleagues, uh, including uh, a Polish refugee named M.G. Greg Becker and their boss, Sam Romano, they were looking at, at uh, a much more conceptual model of rover. This is before NASA had you know, narrowed down um, what it wanted. And they had come upon what they they were able to pretty much demonstrate was the most sure-footed and capable basic design. And that was a six-wheeled, six-by-six rover with a flexible frame. And it, it had a flexible frame between its pairs of wheels, its axles, for, for lack of a better term, um, so that no matter how contorted it became while going over rough terrain, the wheels were always firmly planted. And it enabled it to climb just crazy heights. It could, it could climb objects nearly twice as tall as its wheels. Um, so that's, you know, that, they did that. They were working on that from about 1961 to 1965, probably, and just trying to perfect it. That's where the, originally where the wire wheel that, that was used on the rover came from. If you look at, at those early six-wheeled prototypes that they built, there is a direct lineage to the Mars rovers. You can see elements of those early rovers 
were picked up and and used, you know, decades later. There was also the way in which they got this to fold up so that it fit in that relatively small space that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, and that's that's one of the most ingenious things about it. And Pavlix tested his his theories on how that might work by building a one six scale model. And he, uh, he used his son's GI Joe action figure to to sit in the seat of the the rover just for scale and and you know added realism. And um, and when when he decided that he he had the idea far enough along that it could be shown, he and his boss Sam Romano went to the Marshall Space Flight Center where von Werner von Braun was the director, and uh, it, it, they had the thing radio controlled. So Pavlix drove it across von Braun's office office carpeting while von Braun was on the phone, and you know, von Braun turned around, looked, and said, "What is this?" and they went in and explained it all to him. And by the end of the meeting, Von Brown legendarily slammed his hand down on his desk and said, we must do this. And the rest is history. It is remarkable. Why did it get, I mean, certainly it was a big deal at the time, but not a huge deal. Why do you think that it didn't get the attention it deserved at the time? Well, I think I think part of it is that after Apollo 11, everything deem, dimmed in the shadow of created by that mission, and 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 I think partly that's because it was one of those rare events, maybe the first such event, where pretty much the whole world witnessed something together in real time on live TV. Um, and uh, you know, the other the other part of it is, uh, well, I guess uh, to continue that thought, you know, the later Apollo missions became remarkably commonplace, uh, which is a bit mind boggling to, to consider now, but you know, by Apollo, by, by the end of Apollo 12, we were kind of jaded to the whole idea that we had men walking around on another celestial body. And, uh, you know, when the, when the rover came along, there was some uh, initial, initially a great deal of press interest, um, but I think some people saw it as, as kind of gimmicky. They saw it as you know, the, the obvious um, stunt for the most automotive people on the planet to, you know, to put a car on the moon. And there wasn't really much thought, I think, or much attention given to exactly what it, what it did there, you know, how capable it made the astronauts. What it did do is give us much better um, TV and pictures of of the missions because the rover had a remote controlled TV camera on its front front bumper and uh, an engineer at mission control controlled it. And what that enabled the astronauts to do was, you know, to have not only a TV audience at home watching their every move when they were out in the field, but to have scientists looking over their shoulder and giving them suggestions as to what they might do next. So it, you know, it had a tangible uh, impact on on the quality of the science they were able to do. Now that you know, it's it's difficult to answer the question in any kind of um, a brief, cogent way because I think there were so many factors involved. It, just as there were a lot of factors in in you know the NASA's lunar program budget being cut over the years, and um, it's tough to summarize. And talk about what happened, what the fate of the the vehicles were. Well. As expensive as they were, there, <laughs> despite that, they were they were intended for one use apiece. Uh, so the three rovers who were taken to the moon remain there, and uh, and they can be visited. There's a remarkable uh, orbiter that has been circling the moon for about a dozen years now, uh, and the, it's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it's loaded with instruments that measure various aspects of the lunar environment, but it. It also has a bank of very high resolution cameras that are kind of managed out of Arizona State University. And uh, and you can go on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, website. Actually, there are several. Uh, and look at some of the photos that they've taken. Uh, it's taken of the Apollo landing sites. And they include very clear representations of those rovers parked a couple hundred feet away from the lunar module position so they could, you know, film uh, the astronauts taking off at the end of their missions. And uh, you can also see hundreds of miles of tire tracks 
forming a spray around these these sites. It's uh, it, it, the back the hair on the back of my neck goes up when I look at some of the pictures of of those those tire tracks. It's it's a it's such a forbidding environment, and to see them just taking off into the unknown, it's it's uh, it's exciting and, and terrifying. Talk about the evolution of this for you. You've written about cars. You've written about roads. I mean, in some ways, this is an extension, but pretty different. Yeah, well, you know, I've also written about climate change and about a river. It's, uh, you know, the the great thing about the job is that I get to completely uh, throw out the field and start anew with each project. And but I've I've always been interested in in cars because I think that they more than any other single invention have defined, well, they define the modern world, but they especially define the United States. I mean, we've, we've remade our cities to accommodate them. We, they, they can, they basically dictate where we live, how we live, what we do for a living, what we eat, uh, what we buy. All of that would be completely different if it weren't for the automobile and the roads that we've built to accommodate it. And, um, and we wouldn't have suburbs. We'd be living very differently. And so it's, you know, what may seem kind of a lowbrow subject and at first blush uh, really is it has tentacles that extend into every aspect of our existence. And, and I find that pretty interesting. And it's also interesting that we've, you know, we've, <laughs> we've invented this thing um, that could be our undoing. It's, uh, you know, this is an invention that, in addition to bringing great advances to the human condition, has also had a, a terribly corrosive effect on the health of the planet. And so it's uh, it's interesting from that standpoint as well. Not interesting in a good way necessarily, but, but interesting. It also has always represented a certain kind of freedom that uh, it did for the astronauts as well. It's an extension of the trusty steed, you bet. And uh, and that's part of who we are. You know, I mean, that's uh, we're still frontiersmen, I think, at heart and big chunk of it. Earl Swift. The book is Across the Airless Wilds, the Lunar Rover and the Triumph of the Final Moon Landings. Earl, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.